Hello and welcome back to my Divinity Original Sinti video. This is the final video of my bill guides in regards to my physical physical party. Uh, so yeah, this is the uh, the Necromancer one. Uh, should be very very juicy. Um, we're just gonna do a rundown on potential races to play as a necromancer, the gear, where you should sort of focus your your stats, your attributes, the talent point options, uh, the skills that you could use, what place uh, in the picking order where where you want the necromancer to, to be in your party, what the necromancer itself brings to your party, the combinations and then we'll do like a quick I say quick it'll probably be a long uh, breakdown on how to build your necromancer from the ground up or how I personally have done so so uh, for me um, there is a clear standout as to which race should be picked as a necromancer and I think uh, the elves stand out the most, uh, Sibyl, or a custom role, uh, simply because there's real synergy between flesh sacrifice and um, elemental affinity. The damage increase is huge. The downside with using flesh sacrifice, if you're using a shield, is that you need to to uh, consider that when uh, adjusting your stats which can be a little bit awkward um, or you know if you're like a, a if you're not worried about using a shield then you don't have to think about that at all but most definitely the synergy between the blood surface elemental affinity and the additional damage makes the the, the role of the necromancer to an elf um, I personally have gone with Sibyl as my two-handed custom as the necromancer. The reason why I chose that I think was because I could see more use for breaking the shackles as a two-handed warrior. I could see I could see myself having more geomancer and hydro surface for dam protection. I think that was my thought process at the time as to why I picked picked each one as they, as I did. Other necromancer uh, positions you could always go with Thane. Thane has uh, crit chance, uh, increased crit modifier also, so it does help with the damage side of things. Um, also, it is kind of nice with Thane because a lot of the skills and you being a necromancer, you have sort of self-restore to your health, so you don't need to really worry about healing as such. But also, at the, da the downside is that you can't use your heals on yourself. In the likes of Mass Cleanse Wounds, is useful but it's not as useful uh, humans can make for decent necromancers as well encourage is wanted in the party by at least one party member also because of the crit chance and the crit modifier increase also helps its cause Lizards make pretty terrible necromancers. Again, it's something that I would completely avoid. And I would, again, personally avoid as beast or dwarf. Particularly as a physical, because, again, the it doesn't mesh with what a physical party wants to do. And uh, your passive abilities, they're just not getting... They're just not seeing full use. Uh, but it's a, a clear standout for me as to which is the best, and that would be an elf. 
In terms of the gear, you're going to be looking for intelligence, you're going to be looking for wits, you're going to be looking for points into warfare, uh, critical chance, um, any loose schools that will help you obtain skills. Uh, scoundrel is also desirable when you are able to crit. But those are typically the, the stats that you're going to be looking for. And I'm just going to do a little quick rundown on the actual gear that I have currently with my necromancer. Uh, we have this headpiece. Uh, free intelligence and free wits is very, very, very nice. Um, but the, the rune slot kind of tips it over the edge over a divine item. So having six intelligence and free wits with some resistance is a very, very nice headpiece. And a good balance between physical and magic armor. Decent chest piece here. Would have preferred a different resistance, but I wasn't going to be fussy at this point. Oh, a really nice pair of gloves. It is finesse armor, which kind of <clears throat> is a little bit of a pain to like work this around, but it but but it kind of made sense because my weapon required fourteen finesse as well, so I could justify using uh, getting uh, fourteen in finesse. Um, but I would say. If I knew this prior, then my choice in uh, lessons at the academy might have been different. So I really had to make up the make up the loss and finesse. Um, in a really nice, really nice uh, about here. Um, I really wanted to make this work uh, for my archer, but again, I think when, with hindsight, uh, I might have made different choices. But we've we found a way to make it work for all the characters. So, so she ended up with this this really really nice belt, strength boots, uh, with some wits some uh, fire resistance on it as well, very very nice pair of boots an amazing amazing dagger which gives 25% critical chance or 28% if you include the wits and a rune slot a really really nice shield um, now this is like the difference between me and other players I guess you could go with just raw damage so you could find another weapon to use instead of this and maybe maybe I am wrong um, in this because I don't actually have a reason for this character to be in melee range, but I play her in melee range. Um, so you know, I think I think I could probably trade this off for um, a more offensive item. However. I haven't, the shield is fantastic to be honest, 20% chance to block a, a, a really good array of different stats on there. And it also has Death Witch as well, which is kind of nice. Uh, it has Flay Skin, not a skill that I'm going to be using in a physical party, but it's part of the shield. The shield does have reflect 10% damage to physical which is 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 nice it's really really nice but yeah I chosen to go with the defensive option because of the way of where I play her to be honest come across a really nice neck here five intelligence the rings very very fortunate all super super useful and I'm using these legs because, again, intelligence, constitution, being an elf, both are very, very useful. And the two rune slots as well to increase damage further. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of intelligence here, warfare, scoundrel. Oh, 
so in terms of uh, combat schools uh, skills where do you want your points to be uh, as you can see I have maxed out my warfare as high as I can possibly get it after warfare you want to put your points into scoundrel for additional crit damage uh, we have two points into aeroforge for the uh, mobility skills to teleportation and never swap we have one point in geomancer for fortify nothing in the huntsman but I would say if you're gonna get first aid I would do it here because it's one character that's in melee range can easily use it on two friendlies uh, one who has a glass cannon so I, I could I could use it quite easily but I've opted not to three points into Necker and Hydro to meet uh, Bloodstorm and a few of these other skills uh, and then the standard skills I could throw in Deathwish but I don't really play with it and I have it through the shield anyway here five in Polymorph for Apotheosis one in Pyro for the three Pyro skills that I have here and then Scoundrels just to just for the additional damage nothing here that you really particularly need uh, I happen to have the appointed to leadership which is just off a really nice neck piece which will support my summoner very 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 slightly so in terms of talents I think your options are Elemental Affinity, Hothead, Mnemonic, Savage Sword Leash, The Pawn, All Skilled Up, Bigger and Better, Far Out Man, Living Armor, Picture of Health, Executioner, you could run Torture I suppose, but not really. So this is probably the largest pool of talents that would be useful for you and um, the reason why I've gone with what I've gone with Elemental Affinity is a super super useful talent that is absolutely mandatory in my mind Savage Sword Leash is mandatory uh, and Hothead Pawn oh, is nice for the mobility and I already have two executions in the party so I thought three would be a little bit too heavy, but execution works excellently. So if you you honestly could switch it over, or you could have three executioners, it's completely up to you. But executioner is excellent, and I could understand why somebody would use it. I have gone with the pawn because, like I've already said, I have two executions already, and I could um, position in certain ways <clears throat> that makes it easier for my group of three to sort of stay together and you know I could have a blood pool I can then create another one cheaply and then move to that if I need to move positions so it's, it's kind of nice for that reason Um, so yeah, hot heads to increase the crit and less importantly the accuracy, it doesn't really have an effect here as a mage. Um, so for this build, like I would say, Elemental Affinity and Sword Leash are mandatory and then you could, you could honestly quite, you can switch between Pawn and Executioner. Um, I think Hothead is, is it's probably a staple and then I suppose you could choose between the likes of Mnemonic, you could choose or Skilled Up, you can choose Living Armor, honestly there is a lot of choices and they wouldn't necessarily be bad. So for me, Elemental Affinity is a staple, Hothead I would keep, oh Hothead I would keep, oh to be honest I wouldn't want to give up any of them. 
Though I would say if I was to give up something, I could say you could trade pawn for executioner quite easily. Uh, or you could trade like mnemonic, um, maybe for living armor. If you want to be a little bit more uh, defensive minded, but um, I, I've, I've gone with what I've gone with, so. But um, no, I can completely understand trading this for execution I had to understand and for me it was like a close call between this and living armor and, and to be quite honest like I might even change it even now like those are like the the real strong cases for your talents in my opinion in terms of order um, you're not going to be looking to go first in this party because the summoner is going to be going first so do you want to play second, third or fourth? Um, well the way I, I've set the party up is that I want her to be going second because the other two party members are executioners and I kind of want them to go in third and fourth I do play the ranger like, a, like an assassin type so more often or not she is going in second or fourth second or third, no she is going in second most majority of the cases um, which is kinda nice because she can deal a hell of a lot of damage and kinda set up the executions to finish them off really more than anything or she can fulfill the role in the third and, and do just as good a job um, but yeah the way that I'm utilizing her is she does the damage, they do the kills, but you can quite easily play it a different way if you want to. Because I think out of all the party members, she is capable of doing the most damage. Uh, it's quite ridiculous at times. Uh, so, your optional skills here at end game, and um, this has changed constantly throughout the game I've really I mean maybe I could have done this a little bit sooner but um, I've really just tried to trim down the most the, the amount of memory that I was using to increase my damage and this is kind of where I've come and come down to so Mosquito Swarm is a staple skill, the damage isn't the best but uh, it's ranged attack, restores vitality, really good um, synergy with living armor, definitely keep this one, haste and peace of mind again are your support skills for yourself or teammates. You have Inner Demon for your own personal magic armor, or you can support, so you can support others with armor frost for yourself. I have Raining Blood picked up very, very early in the game. Just allows you to get surfaces pre fights to use during fights also. Living on the Edge I've used here because it is quite an expensive AP but obviously it's reduced down to 2 with Elemental Affinity. With this party I believe I have 2. I have 2 members with it, both with an Elemental Affinity which is kind of what I was looking for. I'm actually surprised myself. I don't actually run Chameleon Cloak on this character. Yeah, I really don't. I mean, I've never run. I've never actually ran it on this one, and I'm kind of wondering why I've not done that. But uh, but there we go. We have the standard uh, adrenaline, pretty much on every single build. We have. Never saw the teleportation to manipulate our enemies. Uh, in this party, we have three members with teleportation, four with never swap. We have fortify, support, 
physical armor from our teammates. And we're running Apotheosis because we're running Bloodstorm with a lot of other good source skills, so it makes complete sense. We're running Cryogenic Stasis. Now, this is a skill that you can honestly just pick up and drop off because. Really, the only reason that I'm using this is because it removes shackles of pain and um, Sibyl is my warrior in this case, so my glass cannon users kind of need it at times. Um, maybe I could drop it, honestly. Honestly, I, th I think the number of enemies that actually has cryogenic state... Uh, that requires me to use this is very few and far between <clears throat> and various ways of actually working around it so actually I'm actually going to drop it I'm going to drop it from this build <clears throat> bouncing shield oh, with an amazing shield like I could have very 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 good damage it scales with the warfare also battle stomp again it gives the build a hard cc an aoe cc achievable because we're using a melee weapon we have a phoenix dive which is our mobility skill Grasp of the Starved, Mandatory Skill again, Mandatory Skill is Infect, very good damage, and I have Restoration, again this has been like a, it's been in my build at times, it's been out of the build at times, and I'd say with heals, overall are more useful in physical parties because yes they do recover your HP but they have a secondary use as well you can use them offensively whereas in magical parties it's kind of like meh so throughout the run I've used restoration I've used healing ritual I've used uh, mass cleanse wounds I've used first aid do I need it? Not necessarily, but I think if I'm going to come up against an undead enemy, this is the this is the skill that I'd rather have, rather than first aid, rather than healing ritual. Yes, this is better AOE, but this is just one AP. I'm not really going to be playing around with water, to be honest. So this is overall the best damage physically, because it's a dot as well. So that's the reason why I am. I've included it in this build. Corpse Explosion is huge. Pick this one up early. So I would say uh, Mosquito Swarm. I'd say all the all the Necro skills here are, are mandatory. I'd say restoration is probably an optional choice, but it's personal preference. Everything else that I would say is is mandatory there. Um, other skills that I I would say are honorable mentions. Shackles of pain is a decent option. Uh, healing ritual is to cryogenic for particular fights is. First aid, because you do have some glass cannon users that don't really want to be knocked down. Death wish is another option. Um, though if I was going to use it, I would definitely have it on the summoner because of torturer. You could run uncanny evasion, but again, I think we're just too heavy on it. We don't need it. Um, other skills that I've just... Um, not included at all here. Uh, mass corpse explosion. Now, if you can, if you can get to use it in the proper way, hundred percent it's worth it. The damage is absolutely stupid. 
but um, throughout my run, I very rarely find myself in that situation. It's a lot easier just to use one singular corpse completion rather than mass corpse completion. I suppose it's a lot easier if you want to be a little bit cheesy and set up like a huge part of corpse by all means and then that's going to see great use but the whole cheesy sort of thing is, is not really my taste. So combinations with this build I mean honestly like a lot of the combinations or high high damage dealing combinations it is is all basically for apotheosis. You're ideally you're popping this before the combat and then you can quite honestly go to work you'll uh, you'll be able to use the combination with flash sacrifice as your elemental affinity you can pump inner demon for increased intelligence and that magic armor hopefully you've already used peace of mind maybe haste as well dream scenario right uh, but yeah, you're setting up a lot of your damage buffs, etc. Hopefully before combat, and then um, you know you're able to use the likes of Bloodstorm, Grasp of the Starved, combination with Skin Graft, doing it over again. And to be honest, most things are pretty much dead at that point. Um, but that is the deadliest combo this this build can provide. So heavy skin, uh, so bloodstorm, grasp of the starved, and elemental affinity. Skin graft, you use your adrenaline, etc., for additional AP along with flesh sacrifice. So you can get quite a lot of damage out through that mean. That means. Um, as for the individual skills and stuff itself in terms of your party you can use dome of protection uh, on your on your teammates quite solidly quite cle clearly it's a very very basic use of it but the thing I really like to do to do f uh, when I play is uh, I like to combine it with um, with my summoner who uses soul soulmate on the warrior who so you kind of cast it on where your summoner is going to be or end up moving you have soulmate on your summoner to the warrior and the warrior can go drift off and is constantly um, restoring physical and magic armor because of that. that's a really cool way of using them with protection And it just allows the warrior to venture away, get to those enemies that are far away, and um, have that peace of mind, so to speak. You have Flesh Sacrifice, which gives you elemental affinity and extra damage, which we've already covered. It's a nice, nice uh, additional use with inner demon with a an intelligence user that increases your damage not just your magic armor which is really really nice we have living war here it is on a piece of gear that I have but I've never used it and I think it's a little rubbish so it's just there because it's there <clears throat> Uh, with Fortify, just bear in mind that, um, of who you want to teleport, so just be sure, just be careful about who you use it on. Uh, Corpse Explosion, I don't think there's anything particularly special about this. You just blow up what's near you, to be quite honest. I've already mentioned about the cheesiness of what you can do with corpses. Don't think there's any particularly special tricks here. Um, with the likes of Never Swap, you can always. There's there's so many really clever little things that you can do to Never Swap. 
you can bring enemies together, you can bring teammates far away back into the fight. Like I remember I had one fight, um, it was the, it was a fight with Gwydion, you know, when you're, you're on the top and then all the blobs around you, and like I would literally have my warrior go out and meet the blobs in the oil, and then I could always pull him back to safety of Neversaw. I always thought that was quite nice. So like, you could send him out to kill stuff, bring him back, or send him somewhere else, which I always thought was kind of a cool idea. Uh, like I've already t I touched upon with restoration, it doesn't really cleanse a lot of a lot of things, but I like it here because not only is it a singular heal, which I don't really primarily have it on the path for, but it's more for an undead enemy, it does really really good damage to them. For 1 AP, you do a lot of physical and then it's like a, a, a constant physical dot as well. And it cures poison, so you know, if they have not poison to recover, you're going to be able to remove that, which is which is really really nice. <clears throat> Uh, Flay skins just here, we're not using it at all. I've already touched on the combination here. Um, like a cheeky little way of using a uh, bouncing shield is you could use your own teammates to bounce a shield off of to hit targets that are out of line of sight that you can't get to. I think maybe you could even use dead corpses for that also, but um, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure you can do that. For battle stomp, uh, just be mindful about the surfaces that you're clearing because you do typically want blood around on the floor. So just make sure you're not removing the blood surfaces that's going to benefit you. Um, but other clever ways that you can use this skill is to clear clouds that may be denying you getting or attacking um, enemies. Um, but just bear in mind that it doesn't actually clear cursed surfaces. <clears throat> uh, one thing I completely forgot about I didn't ever touch on the bloated corpse. Now, for a long time, I used this skill. I think it's great, it's really useful. Kind of tails off a little bit. Um, and then. And then I just. I, I got to a point where I realized that I really wasn't using it almost at all. So I kind of dropped it. But for a long time, you will be using this skill. Uh, the reason why I really like it, it's not as much damage as a corpse explosion, but you can maneuver with it, which is its benefit. You can really position it to, to your liking, which is what I really like about it. And it does also produce like a, a hell of a load of blood as, as well. So, this is a very good skill, but I just found it later in the game with the heavy combination, you're almost never using it. Which is quite sad, really. But it should most definitely get an honourable mention. And and with that, you know, um, with using uh, the raised bloated corpse, like I've already said, you can literally position it perfectly to, to get as much AoE damage as possible. You could use it as... Um, I mean, you could use it as a cheap way of getting blood surface, as well if maybe if uh, blood rains on cooldown, you know, it's just the thoughts. Um, you could use it in conjunction with supercharger if you want to go with summoning. Again, that's completely up to you. You can always use your peace of mind to increase the bloated corpse's damage also. But yeah, I think this is pretty much fine. I think, um, yeah, I'm going to remove the cryogenic stasis. 
I'm going to have a, another point into which to round myself up to 60% crit. So in terms of uh, leveling and character creation, hmm, actually, I just had another thought. I just had another thought actually, and I think I've kind of changed my mind. I think that I am going to go with, well maybe we can go with both, you know. That kind of hurts. You know what, we're going to go with both. And, and and the reason why I thought about this is healing a ritual is super is is very good against undead obviously. You're not really using it for the heal for your teammates. But it's to damage potential to your enemies. That is what I'm thinking. And if you're facing a group of undead, excellent. But more so with Bloodstorm because it disease and decays enemies you're more than likely going to be able to pop this off on multiple enemies and get good use out of this. This is more of a single target um, again very situational but I can see it doing some good work you know maybe that's too many heals from my liking Maybe it's something that I do need to reconsider. Maybe. Maybe it's something that I do need to reconsider. But, um, it, yeah. Anyway, character creation screen. <clears throat> character creation screen. Maximum points into intelligence. And you're going to start off with uh, Elemental Affinity. And I would say your starting skills would probably, probably look like something like this, to be absolutely honest with you. There's really good synergy between Decaying Touch and Restoration. You can either use it as a self-heal, or you can use it as damage, so it's adjustable. This will restore some health at range. This is a decaying skill uh, at close range. And they, they all kind of you know, support in their own way. Uh, between like 1 and 4. Again, you can build this in an offensive way, which is perfectly fine. But with, in combination with what I was building, I had a two-handed warrior and a ranger both were in rage to deal with damage. I had a summoner who was more focused on utility rather than pumping points into summoning and also had this character who was more on the utility side rather than pure damage because I felt the two characters kind of made up for the damage. So between like one and four I think I'd have been looking at I'd have been looking at something like this, like something ridiculous, like a huge, huge amount of uh, a huge amount of memory points for this. And of course, bear in mind, I need a constitution to keep a shield on, whilst using flesh sacrifice also, which is quite difficult to achieve. So I believe at level three. So I start off level one with elemental affinity. Level 3 would have been mnemonic, 100%, <laughs> to sustain all these skills. So this is pretty much what I'd be looking at level 3. You're, you're solid, you're, you're very very solid. you got crowd control, you got a good number of attacks and buffs. Oh, maybe armor of frost as well actually, because I don't think I actually ran it early game on anybody else and it kind of made sense. So maybe something like this is like between one and four. <laughs> uh, I think maybe I would have restoration from the ring to just 
lighten the load and I would pick up um, the memory belt from Rivermore as well again to support so <clears throat> level 4 comes along and we're probably looking at infect I don't think I had much else really going on at this point someone like this and in between like level 4 and level 8 you'll pick up um, the likes of adrenaline maybe a 4 to 5 will jump in there too maybe teleportation maybe uh, maybe uncanny evasion find its way in but it's it's pretty much something along these lines give or take depending on how many school skill points that you actually do have but like I said I chose utility so I would have said it probably looked something like this and to get this it would have been like uh, two necro, one hydro, one pyro, one scoundrel, one geo, two arrow <laughs> so that does, sound quite, that does sound like quite a lot of points and so maybe like level six plus you might might be able to achieve something like this uh... so yeah uh, level eight level eight, it's, this is a tricky so i would have ran pawn at level eight so i would have been looking at elemental affinity mnemonic and pawn um... and then then at like level 8 or 9 would be the time where you could slay slain and pick up his weapon. Now his weapon's really really good for you. And it does give you 10% crit. But like I said before, there is a huge number of options to choose from. Uh, so you could just pick your favorite of the lot, but I would say that you will want to 100% keep Elemental Affinity. And you go Pawn or Executioner. If you want to go down the Crit route, you can go with Sword of Leash. Honestly, like, the ep options are endless. For me, what I think I would choose, I would definitely go with Elemental Affinity. I'd probably go with Pawn, and I probably would go with probably go with Savage Sword of mm, yeah if if I have the the Fang of the Winter Dragon then and maybe a little bit more of something else I think maybe at that time I'd pick up Sword Leash just because I could crit so I might be looking at 15% crit which isn't great maybe it's a little bit early maybe Mnemonic is actually better for the free intelligence would be better um, but I, I hated the idea of wasting crit critical critical chance. Let's see, yeah, level level nine. You're kind of looking at. Uh, I think again depends on how much time you're willing to invest in the gear, etc. But you can you can definitely uh, you definitely pick up Phoenix Dive at this point. You pick up um, Never Swap. For me personally, I think uh, yeah, I think Phoenix Dive is fine. Depending on weapons, you can get a certain weapon with Phoenix Dive. You can go with Living on the Edge. You can go with Death Wish if you so desire. You could go with this, you can go with this. All very viable options. This I have already said is very situational. This you'll use very situationally. And you'll also pick up um, Skin Graft at level 9 too. Then you got a choice between this and this. When you got two source points, then it kind of makes this a little bit easier. 
uh, level 13 uh, will be around the time that you are able to pick up grass but to starve that's a really really big uh, big upgrade for you it actually really allows you to do some really good AoE damage Um, F13 also, of course it gives you another talent point. There's a good number of talents here you could use. I would, so like I said, I would probably have gone Elemental Affinity at 1, Mnemonic at 2, um, and then at level 8 I would probably switch out Mnemonic for Sword to Leash and took on the Pawn. And then maybe at level 13, we could look at, uh, say, Mnemonic or, say, Living Armor or Hothead. You know, whatever you fancy, it's all good choices. And then at level 16, your big, big, big combo comes into play. And I think if you got Healing Ritual works quite nicely with this also. So that's that's kind of just how I see it. Oh well, yeah, level 16 and then once you get to level 18 you can go down your own path but as you can see this is what I've decided upon. And there we go. There we go. Uh, I seem to have taken some skills I don't actually want. Yeah, we don't want the King Touch. And we don't want that, we want the Inner Demon. There we go. I think actually I'm going to drop Restoration. I think this is how I'm going to go. I think I'm just going to go with the... This as AoE damage and as AoE heal. Yeah, hopefully we'll come across some water. And we're just going to use this in conjunction with Bloodstorm. I think that's how I'm going to play it, so we'll end up just putting one point more into Critical Chance. So let's remove that. Let's put this wonderful little. Oh, it's already there. I must be going blind. Very, very possible. So that's pretty much the build to be honest. Um, obviously there's variations, I know some people would want to play a little bit more aggressively, but this is how I play it. Um, as you can see I've got constitution to to meet the shield requirement even if I use flesh sacrifice. Um, so yeah, that's how I would build the necromancer, I would completely understand about um, wanting to play it more aggressively if, you, if your party desperately needs the damage earlier you're not going to be as heavy in, in utility and having as many skills as I did so I'd completely understand it but but that kind of suited my party's needs and that's the way you kind of play the game right you kind of if you're playing in multiplayer um, especially in multiplayer you know you do need some people who are a little bit more accommodating a little bit more supportive and that's what the party of mine here required me to do because I already had two enraged damages which was going to be stupid and they needed some utility skills to back them up so sometimes it just depends on on the situation and what you need as to, as to what, what and where to build so you just got to bear that in mind with your parties it's not, there's not necessarily definitive answers like oh this is correct build sometimes you your alter builds to fit around people and, and you should do that in your own parties but more so in, in multiplayer um, you should definitely be a team player um, you know or you know, sort of have these discussions because um, yeah it's important when you're doing it with multiplayer especially with multiplayer <laughs> hmm uh, so that is the build guide for my Necromancer. I hope that you enjoyed the video. I certainly have enjoyed doing these. Um, positive, 
positive or negative feedback, feel free to leave comments. Not a problem whatsoever. Um, yeah, just hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you. See you in the next one. Cheers.